<laughs> Whoops. That's what happens when you do everything early. It's a great day to be in God's house. Let's stand on our feet, clap our hands, and work. Good morning, Maranatha. I'll go ahead and stand up. Let's get ready to worship the Lord this morning for his goodness. Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, come on now. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all is stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Yes. He makes a way where there ain't no way.
price for all my guilty Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh, He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave There ain't no sinner that He can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and His grace is sweet And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus Oh, many times Jesus saves your life Hallelujah 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 Amen Amen Hallelujah 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 Yes Oh, won't he do it, church? Won't he do it this morning? Praise you, Lord. Oh, we still serve a restoring God. Oh, we worship you, Lord.
Jesus this morning. Somebody said there's no place like this place anywhere near this place, so this must be the place. So welcome to the place this morning. We're glad you're here. We have a full day today in that not only this service yet to be completed, but tonight we'll be meeting again at 5 o'clock for the annual memorial service. I hope you'll plan to join us for that time. Uh, be here in the sanctuary as we honor those who've gone on to be with the Lord in the past year or so. Let's go to prayer together. Father, we ask your blessings upon all that transpires now. May we be very sensitive to the leadership of your spirit, and may we leave this place having deposited what we needed to and having received what you'd have us to receive. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Before you're seated, greet some folks and let them know you're glad they're in church with you today. You may be seated. I see a lot of waving going on this morning, I guess. Maybe we ought to have you all stand back up and we'll do the wave together. Some folks, it's just a long way to have to walk to try to greet them, isn't it? <laughs> Let me mention a couple of things to you in compliance with the Constitution and bylaws that govern this church. We want to make you aware and give you due notice that the annual church business meeting is this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. All of those on the active membership role are encouraged to be here to participate. However, if you're not a member, you're still welcome to come and see how the business of this church is transacted as we uh, elect one board member. Reports will be given as well. And that reminds me that today is the deadline for turning in a nomination for the board. So you need to turn that in today to pastor. And uh, I guess I should have found out before I got up here. We do sign language. He just went. <laughs> well, we're having a good time on our way to heaven. Other announcements you can read for yourself. They're in the bulletin. There'll be some on the screen. We're going to have an inter interesting special this morning, unlike anything that I have seen here and may not have seen it anywhere else, I don't recall, but I believe it's going to be a blessing to your heart, so pay close attention. Ushers are coming now to receive our Sunday morning tithe, missions, and offerings. God bless you as you give. Father, bless our giving today and provide for every need to be met this week in Christ's name. Good morning, Maranatha family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us today for worship. Let's open those church center apps and see what's going on. Ladies, if you're planning to attend our annual ladies trip this year, we need your $50 deposit today. Make sure you get with Teresa Reiner. Be sure to come tonight at five o'clock for our annual memorial service. It's our chance to honor those that we have lost in the past year. This Tuesday at 7 p.m. is our annual business meeting. All members are encouraged to attend and are eligible to vote. This Friday is Painting with Purpose. It starts at 6.30 and the cost is $10 per person. Come on out and bring a friend. This Saturday, make plans to attend Superglue, our group for young married couples. Come at 6 and bring some Italian food to share. Child care is available for a donation. Please sign up in the foyer if you plan to attend. On March 6th, we are launching a new connection class called Maranatha Foundations. This is designed for people who want to learn more about our church and become a part of it. If you would like to sign up for the course, you can do so in our app or at the information center in the foyer. 
Men, if you would like to attend the Georgia Men's Retreat on March 11th and 12th, make sure you see Lane Oliver today. You can sign up in the foyer or on the app. Make sure you download our Church Center app and follow Marinette on social media to keep up with what's going on. Again, we are glad you joined us today for worship. Oh, you 
series that uh, I'm doing for four weeks. I can read that, it's in English. And uh, I hope you'll join me, it's going to be good. Today I'm going to close out this series I've been doing on Return of the King. I know you enjoyed that song. Jordan, that young man plays guitar so well over there. He had a birthday a while back, a few months ago, and uh, and uh, girls, he's 19. Uh, not, I'm, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, at that uh, birthday party uh, gathering, Daniel, he played and sang in their language, India, and uh, they sang and laid, led some praise songs, and it was so cool. I loved it, and, and especially in Indian, they sang it. So I was just blown away when they sang the special this morning. I thought, well, that is so nice. Daniel has such talent, and we kind of, he's kind of had it hid under a bushel, but he has such talent. But I got to tell you, the most amazing thing was the fact that Mundro learned some of that in India. <laughs> I leaned over Pastor Branson in the first service, and I said, Dude, 
I believe Monroe's singing that in the Indian. He said, Monroe can walk on water. <laughs> <laughs> That's his daddy. You knew he'd say that. Wow, what a what a good uh, thing to have you here today. We're excited about um, all that God has taught us over the last few weeks about the end time. It's uh, become it upon us to learn and understand all we can in the light of Scripture to help us be prepared. So I'm glad you're here today. I hope you'll be here next week. Uh, I'm real excited about uh, the message, that the four messages that we'll do on, on the chameleon. I think you'll enjoy that. Today we're going to be talking from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to be looking at Revelation 20. Uh, let me say a word too, about the new uh, class that we were talking about. This class, New Foundations, is only about six weeks. Uh, I'm going to teach a couple Sundays. Brother Branson is going to preach a, a Sunday um, or teach. Uh, Brother Bruce Willingham is going to. We convinced my wife to do one Sunday. And so we're going to just cover things about our church, what you can expect, what we can expect. Or, or what we want to expect, we're going to just talk about a lot of things. So if you want to get from, more familiar with the church and how it works, just sign up. It's just six weeks. So anybody can endure us for that long, I'm sure. And so we'd like for you to be a part of that. In fact, it's going to become mandatory if you're going to join our church before you join to sit through that class and uh, so you'll know a little something before you join. This is called, this week, Caught Up. I'll talk mostly about the rapture or the catching away of the church. I figured out recently that uh, fall is my favorite time of year because during every day it appears that, that uh, it gets a little cooler. It uh, leaves fall off the tree. All of that reminds me, I'm so nostalgic, of two things. College football <laughs> and deer hunting. Go dogs. One of my, uh, uh, I love, I love deer hunting. I love uh, college football. So when I see the fall coming, you know, things start happening, I don't get depressed. I like it. That's one of the wonders or abilities that God gave us as humans is the capacity to think about the future, to look forward, to anticipate things that are coming. And so because hunting and because college football, I thought I went blind. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not depressed when uh, the leaves start turning brown or the temperature starts getting colder, or the days start getting shorter. I'm not a fan of that. But because of my two favorite hobbies, college football and golf, I mean the hunting, I, so I have three, so what? <laughs> you just don't know all the others I have. I look forward to that time of year, looking forward to something, in my opinion. Uh, it can get you through some kind of... Uh, Bad times, rough times. Uh, I had someone call me recently or text me, and they were going through a difficult time because uh, she had lost her father, who happened to be my brother. And uh, she said, I'm so lonely. I miss my dad. And she said, I have you, and I appreciate and love you. But I told her that night I, in the text, I said, Find something that makes you happy right now and do it because that will kind of get you out of that fog. Well, looking forward to things, the anticipation of them, is, is to kind of encourage us, make us feel better, make us enjoy it. I, I think that's why God tells us 
so much and so often he mentions in Scripture about his return. Because it's not to make us afraid or scared, but it, it is to make us encourage. It's to say, hey, the best is yet to come. It's, it's something about that. The Bible says that on the day that Jesus returns, that all of us who know him are going to be caught up together to be with him. That's a phrase that Paul used to describe what happens to, human at G, to humans at Jesus' return we get caught up. And so here's what he says. Here's what he says. First Thessalonians 4. We use this a lot at funerals because we're trying to encourage people. He said, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with him. What's funny is I have that written in another translation, and I'm quoting it in the King James. It's kind of hard. He said in verse 18, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So the idea is that we don't look to Christ's coming as some kind of scary happening, but we understand that that's going to be a glorious day. That, that's what we're working for. That's what we're here for. That's what we're serving God for is that we don't have to live in this world. Abraham said we're just pilgrims uh, passing through, and so we need to remember that. And I'm so afraid today that people don't hear that. I was pastoring in a, another church some years ago, 20, 25 years ago, and I preached a sermon. I don't even remember the sermon, but I preached on the rapture of the church. And I had a young man who had recently started coming to our church from another denomination, and uh, he was dating or married one of the young girls in our church. You get young girls, you can get guys. So, hey, you know, we need some guys in here. Um, that, that wasn't in my sermon, but anyway. He came to me after that sermon, and he looked at me with this sort of blank expression on his face. And he said, I've never heard that. I said, heard what? He said, this rapture thing that you're talking about. I've never heard that. He said, I've been going to church all my life, and I've never heard it. I said, your pastor never preached on it, never mentioned it? Oh, no, never. And I, I felt bad. I thought, man, are there people out there that really don't know that there's a coming of the Lord, that, that this thing ends at some point and that we're going to be a part of that. So between now and then, you and I are going to go through some uh, difficult times, some days that we feel like the temperature maybe gets a little colder or days get a little shorter. And having this moment, knowing that this is going to take place, we look forward to what's going to give us a hope and an anticipation. Bless God, I don't have to live in this world all of my life. And if I do, I know what's coming after that. So I want I want to walk through a kind of a timeline with you this morning on this last sermon of this series and and uh, kind of leading you to an up-to-minute uh, time when Christ will return. I want to show you what return will be like and I want to, you to experience it as, as if it were happening while you're still alive. And I want to show you on this timeline of history when most Bible scholars think that this moment will begin. Now, we've talked about a lot of things when we talk about the coming of the Lord, signs. But some of those signs that we mention are not signs that happened prior to his return but I believe may happen right after his, his return. Some signs in the heavens, some signs that we see. But to understand what the return of Christ will look like, how is it going to happen, I think it's helpful to understand when his return is. Now, a few weeks ago, we mentioned, in fact, that we don't know the day or the hour, right? Nobody. I don't care who tells you they know it. They're lying through their teeth. Because nobody knows that day. There's going to be a day that the Father will look to the Son and say, it's time, go get them. 
And that's when he'll come. And nobody gets to know that day. Nobody knows the hour or day except God himself. And while we don't know the, the date, okay, the date, we do know and can place it in the wind, W-H-E-N, in the wind. And, and within the time frame of what I consider three major uh, periods that are going to take place in the last days. So as we wind this thing up and as we go towards the last days, I want to kind of walk through that for just a second this morning. I believe that there are three time periods that we're looking at at the end of days. The last seven years on planet Earth as we know it and what it's going to be like. What's, it, what's going to happen? Well, I can tell you first and foremost, there's going to be a tribulation. That tribulation is going to last for seven years. Immediately after those distress of days, that's what Matthew calls it, distress or tribulation. Daniel described this tribulation in, in period in this way, way back in like 600 B.C., Daniel gives this prophecy. Seventy weeks are decreed. Seventy weeks. The word weeks, you can translate that word to years. Seventy years, if you want to say that, are to be decreed about your people in your holy city to bring about the rebellion to an end and to put a stop to sin and atone for iniquity, Daniel 9.24 to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So Daniel gives a litany of things that are going to happen over this 70-year span. So the word week, as I mentioned to you here, is literally years. So Daniel is saying God's going to do a lot of kind of transforming work here in the Jewish people and in the world for a period of 70 years. Now, follow along. If you're looking in Daniel 9, or you can look at it later when you revisit this, in Daniel 9.25, he said this, Know this and understand. From the issuing of the decree to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, that's way back, until the anointed one, the ruler, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, and it will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat in a difficult time. So what is he saying? Seven sevens, then, plus 62 sevens is, is the seven-year total. Or actually, that comes to 69. If, if you go way back to the days of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah was told he could go back and restore the wall, Nehemiah went back, and in this miraculous 56 days, he rebuilds the wall. But the rest of the rebuilding of the city actually took 49 years. So if you look at that, and you do the math, 7 times 7 is 49 and our taxes issued that decree in 457 B.C. So that all comes up to, to uh, 69 weeks. So after those 62 weeks, the anointed one, he says, and Daniel will be cut off and will have nothing. Then he writes in verse 26, the latter part of it, the people of the coming ruler will be destroyed, will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end will, will come with a flood until the end there will be war, desolation, or decree. So if you go back and, you know, we talked uh, several times about, uh, about Titus and who came in and destroyed the city and then it was rebuilt and everything. If you get all that down, then you come to 69 weeks. So uh, you come to a place that you got to understand what the last week is. So Daniel said in verse 24, 70 weeks were decreed. We're at 69. Where is the 70th week? That was reserved then for another ruler, another time. It's a place we call, and Daniel calls, the abomination of desolation. It is the place that is going to make up the tribulation. So this other ruler who is yet to come, which is going to be 
uh, coming known as the Antichrist, Brother Branson told me the other morning, he said, you know, if you'd announce you're going to tell who the Antichrist is, we'll fill this place up. <laughs> Problem is, I don't know who he is. Boy, there's been every speculation imaginable about who he, will, who he is. Uh, uh, most of them have died and gone on, and uh, so we know it's not them. But somebody is coming, and somebody's going to become the Antichrist. So for one week or one seven, that time will be called the tribulation. Now, to complete that prophecy, Daniel writes in verse 27, but in the middle of the week, so the middle of the week is going to be three and a half. Three and a half, uh, seven divided is three and a half. So Daniel is saying there's going to be a three and a half year period and then another three and a half period, period totaling seven years of the tribulation. Daniel writes in verse 27, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and offering and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the des desolator. Daniel is basically saying, there's going to be three and a half years. It's going to be tribulation. We read about it. We read all that's going to happen in the, in the revelation. And I'm not going into all of that. I thought about it and I thought, no, we'll be here for the next eight weeks if I do that. And then there's going to be three and a half latter part years. Now, Daniel referred to that as the abomination of desolation. It's the great tribulation or the, I might say, the worst part of the tribulation. I, I was foolish enough when I was young to preach that we're going to have three and a half years of good and three and a half years of bad. I can tell you I was a false prophet. I didn't realize what I was saying. There's going to be three and a half years of hell, and then there's going to be three and a half years of real hell. So you don't think if you're going to get through it and you're going to go through the first part of it, you got it kicked. Uh, don't look at that. So the middle of the week means the, the middle of the seven or three and a half years, and the seven last years of this planet as we know it like it is is simply known as tribulation. You got end time events that are signaling the end time. Doesn't I'm not saying it's signaling the coming of Christ. It, some of it is. Other of it is just signaling the end. The end of the earth, the end of the time that we know as on the earth. The second half of the tribulation is known, as I mentioned, the great tribulation and the Antichrist who, uh, who right in the middle of it, after he's made a covenant with the Jews and they think he's great and he's the Messiah all of a sudden he's going to break that covenant and he's going to say you can't worship in the temple anymore you can't sacrifice anymore and they're going to realize he's not it they're going to realize it's going to be tough and it's going to be late but they're going to realize he's not the one I don't know who he is and I have my opinions but that's kind of what they are as opinions so anyway, that, let me give you a timeline. That takes place, and at the end of the tribulation, Jesus comes with the saints, and he declares war, and then after that war is through, and Jesus wins, by the way. I'll give you that end of the chapter. I always like to be on the winning side. Then he comes in and sets up a thousand-year reign. It's called the millennium. Then after the millennium is over, Satan and, and all of that crowd is kind of loosed again to do their thing, and then comes the uh, wonderful time that the earth is restored, and then heaven is our home. The millennium, found in Revelation 20, verse 4. Millennium means a thousand, thousand years, millennia. Millennia means thousand, um, means thousand years. So millennium is Latin for a thousand years. When Jesus returns, and he will, and he'll set up a rule on earth for a thousand years, speaking of all the believers in the history who have died before Jesus is coming and or been raptured, uh, it talks about it in Revelation 20, verse 4 and 5. At the climax of the tribulation, Jesus 
is going to return, riding on a white horse. We're going to be following him. His mouth, out of his mouth, will go a two-edged sword. With it, he'll destroy those who have rebelled against him and, and set up a thousand-year millennial reign in which the devil and, and the Antichrist and all of them are bound for that thousand years. I don't know if you're able to imagine an eternal state, so to speak, but that's what it's going to be like. I mean, I've never lived, or you have never lived in a world without sin. You've never lived in a world without pain or disease or destruction. You've never lived in a world without war, without uh, criminals breaking in and stealing. You've never done that. But during that thousand years, he's going to set up a, raw, a rule and he's going to rule it with a rod of iron. And if anybody gets out of any rebellion starts, it'll be dealt with immediately. There's no, uh, well, we'll put them off and have 10 trials or whatever. It's going to be done immediately. And so after that thousand years, at the end of it, Jesus is going to uh, release Satan, release the Antichrist, from their temporary imprisonment upon which they'll, uh, they'll come again and try to lead a rebellion. You think the guy would understand by now he's not going to win, but he's going to try it, not this time with angels, but with human beings, those who want to rebel. You can say, Pastor, people are going to rebel after seeing all this take place. Listen, we all know people are humans are crazy, and they'll do anything. So there are some that are going to think we can win, we can rebel, we can join forces with him, and we can take it. But God's going to deal with it very quickly. Revelation 21 said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, don't think that that word passed away means that it explodes and it's no not here anymore the word passed away there means actually renovated it's the same word that's used where paul said therefore we are new creatures old things have passed away that word passed away when when you became a christian you didn't blow up and blow out you didn't dissolve or in fact you didn't change looks i had i had long hair and a skinny body and uh, I changed, but it took a while. Um, but he doesn't say you're going to dissolve. He says, I'm going to renovate you. So for the last, for me, for the last 45, 50 years, he's been renovating me, changing me, building. You know how them, uh, you have them shows on TV where they buy houses and flip them, they renovate them. They go in and rip out the bad stuff and bring in some new stuff and make them look good, and everybody's going, boy, I wish my house looked good. Well, that's exactly what God does in us. When Christ, when we accept Christ, he changes us. He renovates us. He goes in and starts tearing away that stuff that's inside that makes us uh, what we were. And as he tears it away, it not only changes the inside, but guess what? It changes the outside. It renovates us, makes us something new. So he's going to do that to the earth. That's going to be a great time. Uh, I like, wish I had time to, to, to really talk about creation or the new creation, but, but I want to get down to the last fact, and that is the rapture of the church. We've got to get to that point before we get to any of the others. One day, Jesus, uh, the disciples were told, in like manner as you've seen him go, he's going to come again. So we know, and they have been looking for ever since then, the return of Christ. In the same manner, he went away in the clouds, coming back in the clouds. So Paul understood this more than anybody else did. He understood the mysteries of God. Uh, how God revealed it to him is amazing, but one day, he said, Jesus is coming back. Here's what it's going to be like for us. There are three passages in the New Testament that talk about the catching away, catching up 
rapture of the church. Now, if you go looking for the word rapture, you're not going to find it. It's not in there. But the word caught up or catching away is, and that's what it means. Here's, uh, here's what he says in 1 Thessalonians 4. We do not want you to be uninformed. Uh, King James Version said, we don't want you to be ignorant. But that kind of sounds harsh, so they've changed it to uninformed. <laughs> But the key to that is he doesn't want us to be uninformed. He wants us to know what's about to happen and what's going to happen. So he wants us to understand that. We not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep. He's talking about those who've died. That's what they use for that phrase. So that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. When Christians stand by the graveside of one of their loved ones, the great thing that we have is the ability to see the future. It's the ability to go, hey, I'm going to be with them again. If they're Christians, I'm going to be with them again. We, <clears throat> we have that ability to realize as things are changing, God's getting ready for a new season. Fall turns into winter, winter to spring, spring to summer. And so when we as Christians stand by the graveside of somebody who's gone on, God is saying, I'm transitioning now from this to this. This is how it works. And he says, you have, you're not like other people. They don't have any hope. They stand there. They don't know about heaven or hell. They don't know about God loving us. And they stand there and they're, they're grieving. You say, you're not supposed to grieve? Oh, yeah, you can grieve. But you don't grieve because you'll not see them again. You, don't, you may grieve at their loss, but you know, as a Christian, that's the great thing that we look forward to, like college football and hunting. You look forward to the time that you're going to be able to be with those who've gone. So here, here he goes. For the rest who have no hope, people that don't have Jesus have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same manner, through Jesus Christ, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. We're not getting in the way. They're coming out. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I told him in the first service, I hope I'm preaching a funeral that day. I, I ain't kidding. I hope I'm standing in the middle of a graveyard with a Bible in hand and talking about this very scripture. All of a sudden, boom, graves up and open up. People start you say, are you kidding? I don't know. It looks like it to me. I want to be there. I, I, some of them people are going to be a scared. Then we which are still alive who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever or always be with the Lord. And then he gives us in verse 18 the words that I love to read at a funeral. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Why does he say that? If I know my dad or mom or brother or niece or somebody laying there, I know there's hope. You say, were they Christians? I don't know. I'm not judge or jury. I decided a long time ago, I don't get to be judge or jury. All I know is, I believe God's gracious and merciful. So what he does is his business, not mine. I'm not sent here to judge people or you can go and you can't. God, I'm glad I don't have that job. I'm just here to tell you the way, show you the way. That's all my job is. So God wants us to know about his return. It's, he doesn't want, the time may be a secret, but the action is not a secret. He wants us to know about his return. He, he wants the, to us to know the moment of his return in the sense that 
we know and understand what's happening. We're not like everybody else, confused and wondering what in the world has happened. So he doesn't want you, he says, to be uninformed. So the next thing is to understand what the catching away or rapture of the church, what does that look like? Well, in 1 Thessalonians 4, he kind of tells us a little bit. He'll come down to the atmosphere. I, where is he coming? I don't know. Somewhere up there, he's coming. And, and uh, you might remember 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus ascended. I told you all ago, ascended into heaven. And someday, he's coming back. He said, just in the same manner he has gone, he's coming back. So that's what he's going to do. Now, according to Scripture at that time, there's going to be a loud command with the voice of an archangel which will verbally summon all believers. That means everybody in the world will hear it. No, that means only those whose ear is attentive. Only those who are Christians will hear that voice. I don't believe everybody gets to hear it. Now, I may be wrong, but I, I, I told Brother Branson a while ago, I said, did I get all of that right in the first service? <laughs> I don't know how it works, but I believe he's going to call them. And, and so... As he does, he's going to verbally call all of them who have died and are waiting for that temporary uh, heavenly body, physical, that new physical body. I, I, I can't wait. I'm tired of this one. It's getting kind of old and wore out. And it gets harder. I learn new words every day when I get up. Ooh, oh, it, it's not good, not good. So the Lord is going to summon all the believers and the archangel is going to blow his trumpet, according to 1 Thessalonians. And at that sound, the scripture said, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, I have people all the time, and I'm sure the other pastors have as well. They want to know, how's that going to happen? How does that work? i got a great theological answer. I don't have a clue. <laughs> i just be honest with you. I don't know how the dead in Christ are going to rise except the resurrection power. I don't know what they'll be like except to know he said we'd be like him. I don't know except to know he says they'll live again. Now, those are things I know. How it happens, I'm not sure. But the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Well, if you look at Jesus on what we celebrate as Easter, he rose from the dead. He had a type of body to where he could, he could change the molecules to pass right through a wall, and yet he could sit on a beach and eat a piece of fish. He could walk with two guys on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't know who he was, and then all of a sudden, sudden something revealed to them that this was Jesus who had just been crucified. How does that stuff work? I don't know how it works. I don't have theological answers for that. Brother Branson, a lot smarter than I am, and he probably does, but I don't. <laughs> but an instant after the, all the believers are assembled, they come up. Somebody said, why did they come up first? I guess they got further to go. I don't know. They come up out of the ground. Then it says the alive in Christ. Those who are alive in Christ. Just think. If you're here, when the catching away of the church comes and you're alive, you're going to meet those people who come up and together you're going to ascend up into heaven with the Lord. Pastor, is that true? Well, that's what Scripture says. You won't even need like a Superman cape or an Iron Man suit. You're going to just... Whew. I believe that we'll ascend just like Jesus did over 2,000 years ago. We'll meet him, according to Thessalonians. We'll meet him in the clouds. And uh, in Roman times, back some years ago, when a general had conquered a city, he didn't just immediately come in. He would go out and assemble outside of the city with an entourage of people. And when the time was right and the villagers were all right, he would come in and meet them and, and, uh, from a mile outside of town he would come in and make his grand entrance. Jesus, at whatever point in time he comes, is about to make his grand entrance. 
We've talked about it. We've preached about it. We've read about it. We've talked about it Sunday morning, Sunday night. And yet there are still like men like that young man who had never heard that Jesus was coming. Jesus, we've been talking about his coming. It, ha it hasn't been to make us afraid. It hasn't been to scare us. But it's, it's been to make us aware that he's coming. To make us aware and, and, and happy that one day we're going to leave this world. I don't know about you, but I, I'm not crazy about this world. I mean, I'm not looking to die, but hey, this is a wicked place. You're afraid afraid to almost do anything anymore because people are, they've gone nuts. The rebellion is such that it's, you're just afraid to eat in restaurants. You almost, I, I sit with my face to the door. Teresa will go in and she'll say, which seat you want? Never mind, I know, you want to face the door. You got it. We're going to meet him in the clouds. We're going to be taken away. We're going to be with him and things will change for our life forever. Here's a picture that Corinthians, Corinthians 15 gives us. Paul writes, listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. That means those who are dead are going to be changed. Those who are alive are going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and will be changed. For this corruptible body must put, be clothed with incorruptibility. And this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. You can't go to heaven without that. We'd burn up in the atmosphere if we went like we are now. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, then this mortal body, which is clothed in immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That thing that so many people fear, death. That thing that separates us, death. He said it's going to be swallowed up. No more. Then he says, where is your death? And death, where is your victory? And death, where is your sting? You've lost your stinger. Sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my brothers, dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know not what your labor, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So God is saying to us, don't get afraid and sit down and get behind closed doors. Oh, my God, he's coming. I've got I've to just sit here and wait on him. That, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, as you see these signs appear, you see these things come into place. Get to work. Work harder than you've ever worked. Don't take a break. Don't slow down. Don't stop. Don't sit on a pew and say, well, I just, I'm just waiting on the coming of the Lord. Get ready to work because that's what we need to do. I look for ways every day to witness to somebody. Every time I'm in a store, every moment I take, if I'm with somebody, I look for ways to witness to people because we need to know that Jesus is coming. Now, what's going to happen when he comes? Paul says we're going to be changed instantly, instantly in a twinkling of an eye. Well, that's pretty fast, twinkling. You just blink one time. That's, that's pretty quick. Some of us are a little slow at it. But follow this for a minute. Do you know that there is about an inch difference, I didn't know this, I had to read this, between the front of your iris and the back of your retina. There's almost an inch. Now, light travels, I did know this, 
at 186,000 miles per second. I don't know about you. That is quick. It runs faster than my motorcycle. At that speed, it takes 60, a, a 64th of a second to travel from that iris to that retina. 64. They call it a 64th of a nanosecond. I don't even know how to compute that. It's faster than anything I've ever seen. It's quicker than anything I've ever known. And Jesus said, Paul said, we're going to be changed. People are not going to really notice it because it's going to happen so quickly. They won't even know it. We'll know it. They won't know it. One minute dead, next minute. Pew. One minute sad, the next minute pew, heaven. One minute in pain, oh, my God, pew, gone. Pain gone, you gone. When you read, uh, I mentioned a while ago, the post uh, uh, resurrection accounts of Jesus and what all he could do, travel through walls, eat fish. That's what our bodies are going to be like. Really? How does that happen? I told you. I don't know. I don't know everything. I know you think I do. I know that because somebody said he thinks he knows everything. So we'll get those new bodies in a 64th of a second, of a nanosecond. Third passage covers our condition at his return. That's uh, Revelation 20. They came to life and reigned for with Christ for a thousand years. We are caught up. Things are going on. Marriage, supper of the Lamb. Boy, I'm looking forward to that. What they're going to serve? I don't know, but I believe it'll all be good. We're going to eat together, worship Christ. And then after the seven years of tribulation, I believe God's going to say, okay, go take care of things. Out of the eastern sky, white steed, and he who sits, him, sits on him, whose eyes were as flame and fire, who had a vesture, who said, this is me, <laughs> coming back. And Scripture tells us in chapter 19 that we're with him. We don't have to fight. We don't have to do anything. We just ride with him. And out of his mouth will go a two-edged sword. And with it, he'll slay the nations. And he'll put everything back the way that it should be for a thousand years. Will it be rebellion? Yes, but it'll be taken care of. And for a thousand years, he'll rule the earth with a rod of iron. Then, at the end of that thousand years... He's turning that mean old devil and that antichrist back out. Some people say, why is he doing that? Giving everybody a chance that's left to make it right. Now, I'm pretty sure at that point, a lot of people have just too far gone. But I'm not sure. So I believe that he's coming back to do just that. So the question then comes, and this is the way I'm going to leave it. When will the return of Christ come? Well, there are three schools of thought. There's a pre-tribulation, there's a mid-tribulation, and there's a post-tribulation rapture. Now, first and foremost, let me tell you something. Whatever you believe concerning that is your own business. It does not affect your salvation. Pastor, I can't believe you said that. What well, has nothing to do with salvation. This had to do, has to do with understanding end times events. And let me tell you something. People differ on that. There are people a lot smarter than me that differ with me. And if they don't mind, as Brother Branson said, being wrong, let them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But when the rapture occurs... Is it has nothing to do with your salvation. 
if you're saved, whenever that rapture catching away of the church happens, guess what? You get to go. But I wanted you to know what these are. I'm not afraid of that, so I want you to know. There is first the pre-tribulation rapture. This is the group that believes that Jesus will come, catch the church away, and then he'll come again at the beginning of the thousand-year reign. He'll come again. Once the tribulation begins, the saints are taken out to heaven and spared from this time of judgment and hell on earth and all the chaos of all the uh, things as he judges Israel and the world. A second group believes in the mid-tribulation. That means at the middle part of the seven years, a three-and-a-half-year period, they believe that the Christians will go through the they say relatively mild. I'm not sure that's a word that can be used with the tribulation. But they believe they'll go through the tribulation three and a half period, years period, and then they'll be taken out as the Antichrist sets himself up, up as, as Lord of the temple and, and breaks a covenant with Israel and takes over everything. So they believe they'll go through the first part of the tribulation, but not, not the uh, great tribulation. And then there's a third group of Bible, I want to call them Bible-believing Christians because they just interpret it different than maybe you or I do. And that, believe it or not, I can't believe I say this, but it's okay if they do. It's okay. This view believes that we'll be protected in the midst of the tribulation. And they often reference Israel being in Egypt, being protected and, and sheltered but there's some problems with that because it doesn't equate to other scripture that he says we will be kept from those things. And so in John 17, they use the scripture, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them, and he says, from the world. And that's true in reference to the disciples, but I believe in, in Revelation, we're told that because you have kept my commands to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation or testing that is going to come upon, that's Revelation 3.10, that is coming on all the world. So here's what I believe. I believe that, uh, and, and I want to tell you that, that it's my belief. You can weigh your options whatever way you want to. But as your pastor or as the pastor of this church, I think I'm obligated to let you know where I stand on this subject. I believe that Jesus will return just before the tribulation begins. Now, that's, that's what I believe as a pastor. I'm not telling you have to believe that. I'm just telling you that's what I believe. And so let me give you what I, what I believe is my reasons in a condensed kind of version. There's really just three that I look at. There's a lot more. But the three I want to leave you with is this. Number one, Revelation is, is divided in three books. I'll talk about that in, in three parts, and I'll talk about that in a minute. John was told, I want to show you what was, what is, and what is to come. So Revelation is divided in three areas, what was, what is, and what is to come. And any time you disrupt that uh, correlation of Scripture, it changes the interpretation and in how you might believe it. So if, if you look at what was and then what is, before what is to come, in the latter part of chapter 3 of the Revelation, there is a marked change in the attitude or God's attitude towards humanity in regards to, to judgment and mercy. In the first three chapters, he presented more as a God of mercy and a God of, judge, uh, 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 of mercy and leniency. And then at the end of chapter 3, in the beginning of chapter 4, he becomes, from chapter 4 all the way to chapter 19, he becomes a God of judgment. 
You say, oh, he's not like that. Well, you open the book and read, you'll find he is like that. And he judges the earth, and he does that in order to bring about a change in people that weren't ready to change and accept what Christ did as our Savior. And so I believe when you see this marked attitude, change in God, it's a definition or or, or definitive between what was, what is, and then what is to come. The second reason, it follows the natural divisions of Revelation. Revelation is divided in those three parts. And, it, and if, you, if you understand that, that division and, and if you read Revelation with that kind of thought, you understand God was saying to John, I want to show you what was. I want to show you what is, but I want to show you what is to come. And then the third thing is this. And maybe, in my belief, more important than anything else. Nowhere are the words church or churches found and are mentioned in Revelation after chapter 3, verse 22, all the way to Revelation 22 and 6. The word church or churches is never mentioned on the earth. We who believe in pre-tribulation rapture believe that when Jesus was given a revelation that in chapter 4, the first verse, they look down at John and say the words, come up here. The next scene that you see is John in heaven. You see John then begin to see the things which are to come. And so from that point to Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back, and the church, by the way, is with him. Those of us who have died and go on, we are with him. So somewhere or another, we had to get there. That's why some say, well, it was mid-trib, and some say, well, it was right after the end of the tribulation. But that's not true because the end of the tribulation hadn't always come to an end when Jesus comes back. And we're with him. We get to be with him. So... I believe, having said all of that, I want to say this to you, so I don't, want to, um, I don't want to make you think that you have to believe it exactly like I believe it, even though I'm right. No. <laughs> all Bible-believing Christians agree that whatever we believe about the timing of the rapture is not a doctrine that should divide us or disqualify anybody from heaven. So if there's somebody listening to me on the Internet or in this building, and you say, well, you know, I I believe we're going through the tribulation. Listen, I'll love your neck and let you do it. But I hope to get out of here. They call it escapism. They can call it whatever they want to. I want out. I don't want to be here when all that junk takes place. And if I can get out of here, I'm getting out of here. But if I don't, he'll take care of me no matter what. So, that's my view on all of the things that are happening. There are some things that have happened. We talked about uh, sacrifice of the blood uh, of the red heifer. And we've talked about the moon and the stars and stuff like that. Some of that's going to happen prior to the tribulation. Some is going to happen during and after the, or during tribulation. The whole point is found in Paul's words. Comfort one another with these words. My suggestion to you is no matter what time Jesus comes, he is returning. And we ought to be encouraged because this is the ultimate great moment in history when we will meet him face to face it's that time that we get to be together so my point to you is I I really don't care if you believe whatever or whatever I just want you to be ready Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
because you know that your labor is not in vain. What we're doing here today, what we're doing here as a church, what we're doing in missions, what we're doing in, in the new event that's coming on this day uh, in a few months, we're doing for the sake of eternity to change people's lives. I want to be ready, and I want everybody else to be ready as well. So if you're a, sitting in this place today, and maybe you're not quite where you need to be, maybe you're just kind of floundering around and you're hoping, hoping that maybe right at the end, you're going to make it in. But what if you don't? What if you play around a little too long? What if you ignore his call one second later than you should have? What if you are standing there one day and your mate goes, you don't even know what's happened to her. Where does she go? You got to be ready nothing to do with anything else today. You just got to be ready. You've got to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and then you've got to live for him. What is living for him? It says work, labor. Know that your labor is not in vain. It's imperative for us to get to work, roll up our sleeves. We're trying to do that as a church. I sit with the staff every week, and we talk about what can we do, what can we do, not just to build numbers, but what can we do to reach people with the message of the gospel. Least they need to hear. Because one of these days, the church is going to be caught out of here. Some have played around with God so long, they don't even feel that touch anymore. Let me tell you something, church. That's a dangerous place to be. I sit in a church for most of my childhood, and I would feel, even as a child, I'd feel God tugging at my heart. I'd, I'd hear that small, still voice that would say, you need to get right. And every Sunday I'd fight it. No way. I'm way too young for this. I can't about, I'm not about to. And back then we were told you couldn't do anything. It wasn't about loving Jesus. And so I wouldn't give up. And I missed, I missed that whole opportunity to become a Christian, to live, to live right. I missed all of my teenage life not serving God. Until one day, most of you know the story, he came to my house, made a visit, said, today's your day. And I ran to him, and I've been serving him ever since. Are you perfect? No, I'm not perfect. I live with Teresa. I'm not perfect. <laughs> but I became a Christian. It was the greatest thing that ever happened in all of my life, outside of my kids and, and Teresa, that was the one distinct and most wonderful thing that ever happened in my life. And that's all Jesus wants for you. Some of you sitting here, you fight him week after week. I know I ought to make a commitment. I ought to get closer to God. But you don't do it. And I'm not trying to make you afraid, but I am trying to remind you that one of these days, when we least expect it, when we don't know it, others are going to hear a trumpet sound. Others are going to be caught up and caught away. And you're going to be left here to face whatever is coming this way. So I encourage you this morning. My heart breaks. I want you to become a Christian. I don't know what that means. Jesus said if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. I, I don't know why he wants me to say this, but... Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died and rose again for your sins and mine. In other words, he went to the cross, he bled, and that blood washed away all of our sins. He was the 
perfect and ultimate sacrifice. There need never be another sacrifice. He was one and only. And if you're willing to acknowledge that and accept him this morning, then you're saved. You can be saved just by praying a simple prayer. It doesn't have to be, I'm not sure I prayed a prayer. That day I went to Brother Nam's and Sister Nam's home and I said, look, I need to pray. He said, looks like you've already learned how. (laughs) I just knew I needed a Savior. My life needed to change. I wasn't afraid necessarily to go to hell. I just was hating the way I lived, and I wanted a new life. And you know what? Just like that, I accepted Christ. Changed just like that. Changed everything. Changed. I went to church that night, hair long, skinny body, drugged out of my mind and drinking the night before. Saved just like that. Saved. You know what? God did go, boy, I'm I'm not giving you a chance. You are sorry, no good for I knew that. Boy, he just ushered me right in. And this church, this church, when it was over there, took me in. They knew. I'd been a rebellious person all my life. But Jesus came in that day. Are you here just a moment? <laughs> Heavenly Father, I don't really know who's here today. I, I know people, but I don't know them like you know them. You know what's really in their heart. You know if they really have given over their life to you and made you Lord. You know if they that sit here today have made things right with you and are looking forward to the time that you come and catch us away. So, Lord, I don't pretend to know them, but I know that the Holy Spirit does. Just like you did when I was a child, I'd love for you to walk the aisles of this building right now. And I'd love for you to speak to the hearts of those that are here. And in your own way, convince them you need a Savior. And then, Lord, help them to invite you into their hearts and live for you. So, Holy Spirit, do that right now. Talk, talk to these people. Talk to every heart in this place today. And if a person has drifted away, Holy Spirit, bring them back. If they've never accepted you, help them to do that today. If they did, but they didn't know or mean what they said, let them say it again. Lord, I need you. And do whatever it takes to bring them in. Now, while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, this serious moment here, the destiny of men and women are right now held in the balance of this service. The devil doesn't want you to make that decision. He wants you to go away saying, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. That's my line. I used it all my life. I'll do it later. Fortunately, later came. But unfortunately, I'd wasted a lot of time. Some people won't have later. Some people will go out to meet him this week. We've had more people die this year than any other time that I can remember in history. People are dying. And they need Jesus. Let me ask you a simple question. If you don't know him or you've walked away from him, you'll just slip that hand up right now. Nobody's looking around. You'd be saying to me, Pastor, I'm not ready. I see one hand. Are there others? Are there others that'll slip that hand up? Others that'll slip that hand up? I'm I'm not ready. I'm not sure I understand everything you're talking about today, Pastor, but I know one thing. I'm not ready. I've not accepted Christ as my personal Savior. I, I can't believe out of a crowd this size, just one would lift a hand? Are there others? Maybe you're not sure. I I haven't made an appeal like this in quite some time. Maybe you're not sure where you stand. If you're not, slip that hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you're not sure. That's That's not a hard place to be. Not sure. 
I want to ask one more question. If you lifted your hand, you'd like to step out in the aisle and walk down to this front. Somebody will meet you here, and they'll pray for you. And I just want to give you that opportunity. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for touching hearts. I pray that you'll make us all a little uneasy to make us check ourselves, make sure of our relationship with you, and to always pray in such a way that you're our advocate, that you go to bat for us. It's not anything we do as a person, but that you've done as a Christ as a great sacrifice for our sins. Help us, I pray. Find a place with you today that we need to be. In Jesus' name. Stand with me together. Pastor Branson's going to.